Hello, everyone. Uh, we waited for a few seconds so people can um, still log on and prepare. Um, welcome to this ESID Grand Rounds webinar, which is scheduled today um, on the topic of hematopoietic stem cell transplant for adults with inborn errors of immunity. And I'm very happy that we can have this webinar. And um, I'm even more happy that we have two fantastic speakers today. Um, we have Jen Kanakri from the NCI and NIH in the USA who, will, who can join us. And we have Emma Morris from the UCL in London uh, joining us as well. Both are very well-known experts in the field of transplantation, especially for patients with inborn errors of immunity. And they will share not only their own experiences, but also uh, data that are published. And then we will also have chances to discuss specific cases. And later on, we will have a Q&A session after both talks. Um, so please, while you listen to the talks, submit your questions while um, they pop up and submit them via the Q&A function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Um, there's also the chat function, but that is only for technical questions if you have any trouble with the Zoom or anything else. So please, questions via Q&A. And without any further ado, I would like to call um, Jen Kanakri to talk to us um, about her experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and are you seeing this as a full screen? Uh, no, you have to uh, switch I'll the switch. settings again. Well, there you go. There we go. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm Jen Kanakri, and I'm going to talk today about reduced myeloid toxicity with augmented host lymphodepletion and robust immune reconstitution, some of the novel approaches that we are taking to allotransplant for IEI at the NIH. I have no conflicts of interest. Learning objectives will be to understand and discuss modifiable factors within a transplant approach that can improve engraftment and immune reconstitution while preventing graft versus host disease, as well as review barriers to successful transplant and approaches that may mitigate those risks and the kinetics of engraftment and immune reconstitution with reduced intensity approaches. But first I'll start with a case presentation. Um, taking you back to 2008, when a 26-year-old man presented to the NIH with a history of recurrent upper and lower respiratory tract infections, otitis media, and bronchiectasis, and was being evaluated by the pulmonary team for presumptive primary ciliary dyskinesia. He was born premature, uh, along with a fraternal twin, and at birth, he was hospitalized for 30 days for underdeveloped lungs, and notably, he was sicker than his twin brother. He, however, had no major medical problems until around the age of seven, where he developed a relatively severe um, but outpatient managed varicella infection, but also had recurrent upper respiratory tract infection, sinus infections, and pneumonias. Of note, he did tolerate all vaccines, including live vaccines. On imaging for his pneumonias, he was found to have evidence of bronchi bronchiectasis and he underwent a workup for cystic fibrosis that was negative. He required sinus surgeries, had multiple episodes of bronchitis and pneumonia, several episodes a year of bacterial sinusitis, shingles as a teenager, and reports of warts that were sort of beyond what would be expected, but would come and go. He lived his whole life on the East Coast in a rural part of Pennsylvania, working as an adult, as a cook, but really no significant occupational or environmental exposures apart from secondhand smoke as a child. In his family history, his mother had died at the age of 42 of sort of unclear reasons, but kidney problems. His father had heart disease. His fraternal brother remained healthy and, and was serving in the military. He had two other sisters who were healthy and an older brother who was estranged from the family with unknown health status. Of note, his maternal aunt um, did have recurrent respiratory infections and low immunoglobulin levels requiring IVIG replacement. He had no allergies and largely was on medicines to control his sinopulmonary issues. 
On exam, he had tympanic membranes that did not move. He had edematous nasal mucosa, bilateral uh, crackles at the bases of his lungs, and severe digital clubbing. On laboratory evaluation, he was lymphopenic with low uh, immune subsets, but normal immunoglobulin levels. He um, underwent evaluation for primary ciliary dyskinesia and had an abnormally low nasal nitric oxide test, as well as a dyskinetic ciliary motion on video microscopy. However, electron microscopy of the cilia was normal and genetic testing for over 40 genes known at the time was unremarkable, uh, just one variant of uncertain significance, but not causative for primary ciliary dyskinesia. He did have blood drawn at that time back in 2008 for batched whole exome sequencing as resources and time allowed. But he was given a diagnosis of PCD in 2008, despite the um, not sort of slam dunk case for, for this diagnosis. He uh, continued to receive care in Pennsylvania with his home doctors. Um, and in 2015, felt like he was hit by a truck, had fevers and, and other constitutional symptoms, developed hemoptysis, and on imaging was found to have a large mediastinal mass, underwent biopsy of the mass, and was diagnosed with an EBV negative diffuse large B cell lymphoma, although it was a bit unusual with some focal EBV positive lymphoid proliferations. He was started on standard uh, therapy with our EPOC, was slated to get eight cycles of, of chemo with curative intent, um, but developed a, a pulmonary embolus and pneumonia and actually lost his health insurance after uh, six cycles, but imaging showed a complete response. And so they stopped at that point. However, just a month later, he was experiencing shortness of breath and imaging showed multiple lung lesions that were thought to be pneumonia and treated as such. For the next uh, six, seven months, he had additional issues, including abdominal pain and, and a GI bleed, uh, where imaging showed colonic masses that, and he underwent biopsy that were consistent with an EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. He was given two cycles of salvage chemotherapy and started on a pathway to pursue an auto transplant in remission by his home doctors. Um, he had an info session for auto transplant. He had all the, the pre auto transplant evaluations of note. His PFTs were quite terrible. Um, and then as he was getting imaging uh, to, to assess his disease status right before auto, he was found to have a persistent consolidation with biopsy showing diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So they sent him for radiation of the lesion in his lungs. And then um, we're still on the pathway to auto transplant, but decided to refer him to NIH to see if he would be a candidate for CD19 CAR T cell therapy. So um, many years later, he arrives back at NIH and um, we're going to do an audience poll of, of what the CAR T cell uh, team makes of this patient at this time. There it is. So um, we'll give you a few seconds to answer if this is a standard or lapsed refractory patient that's amenable to CARs, if he's in remission and should go straight to auto as his home doctor's planned. Maybe he's not the best CAR T candidate because of his lung status. Um, or he's so lymphopenic, maybe, maybe CAR T generation will fail, or something bigger is not right here, and, and they should call me and, and my colleague, Dr. Dimitrova. All right, so everyone wants to call me, which is actually what happened, um, fortunately. And, and so we started getting wind of, of this patient. Let me see if I can close this. Okay. Um, so as he's returning to the NIH to be considered by the CAR-T 
team, serendipitously, his whole exome sequencing is also resulting by a different team and a different institute, but it's going actually in a different electronic medical record. Um, but he is found to have an, uh, a hypomorphic variant of XGID. And um, of all the, the PCD uh, patients on studied, there were actually other adults uh, who were diagnosed with monogenetic IEI diagnoses as well. And you can see patient number three is the one we're talking about now. And so he gets swooped up by, by multiple teams at NIH and we start looking him head to toe. And he has lesions in his lungs that are lymphoma, but he also has stenotrophomonas and pneumocystis. He has a kidney mass that we biopsy, and it's also an EBV positive proliferative disorder. And as the pathologists are looking through all the different biopsies over time, they're each distinct B cell clones, and they actually stopped counting clones because they're just like, it's not going to change what we do. He was found to have chronic norovirus and cryptosporidium. His lung function tests, he's now gotten radiation, um, are much worse, and his DLCO is 33%. He has restrictive and obstructive and diffusion defects. He's on two to five liters of nasal cannula supplemental oxygen. He's had multiple PEs and has some cardiac strain from that. His alkaline phosphatase is 3,000 from the cryptosporidium. Mm -hmm. uh, and so another audience poll, what do you do now for this patient? And so um, many choices are here. Do you take them to a reduced intensity transplant? We can't give TRIO in the US, but we can use busulfan. Do you try to give them a non-myeloablative transplant using something like fludarabine and TBI? Do you say this patient is not fit for any kind of transplant and give them best supportive care? Or do you proceed as his home doctor is, is set on doing to auto transplant? Um, because allotransplant would just be deadly for this patient, or do you optimize him and try to get him to a transplant that avoids TBI? And so people want to try to transplant them. Um, and that's what I wanted to try to do too. But first, I will, I will move away from the patient case. I'll come back to it at the end. And I'll talk to you about the work that we've been doing for the last seven years um, at the NIH. Uh, the first was a clinical trial of reduced intensity transplant for any primary immune deficiency disease. I opened it in 2015. Dr. Dimitrova is now the PI. And the goals were to transplant monogenetic IEI diseases that had never been transplanted before using a novel reduced toxicity, reduced intensity approach with a primary endpoint of severe acute GVHD free breath failure free survival. It was open to patients age four years and up. That's the youngest we can transplant at the NIH um, with either defined or unknown immune defects that are potentially curable through transplant of a severity sufficient to justify the risks and adequate organ function. And we allowed for matched unrelated, matched related, and HLA haploidentical donors. This is the platform that we used, which was our, our novel approach using pentastatin, which is a bit more potent than fludarabine at lymphodepletion, along with hyperfractionated low-dose cyclophosphamide, followed by two days of pharmacokinetically dosed busulfan, a bone marrow graft, and then a post-transplant cyclophosphamide-based GVHD prophylaxis using serolimus and MMF as adjuncts. We've transplanted nearly 50 patients to date on um, various iterations of, of this platform. The first is published in the references down below um, for the first 20 patients on the reduced intensity arm. And as you can see, the majority of these patients were adults, and some were actually um, in their fifth or, or sixth decade of life um, with a range of diagnoses, high HCTCI comorbidity indices predicting high chances of non-relapse uh, transplant-related mortality. 
Many with um, malignancy is a second indication for transplant. And then the donor source is an allograft type shown there. The outcomes were overall quite good um, with high overall survival and graft failure, free GVHD, free survival. And this is just the first 20 patients, although the outcomes have remained good across the 50 patients we've transplanted to date. The chimerism also overall was quite good, although you can see early on around day 28 to day 60, um, particularly in the T-cell compartment, there was often a uh, lower uh, donor T-cell chimerism that would come up for the majority of patients with time. However, in a more granular view of box and whisker plots of all the patients, some patients remained mixed chimeras uh, even years after transplant. We did see, however, favorable immune reconstitution, and this shows um, immune recovery in various immune subsets over the years, going up to three years in, in this plot from the, from the paper. Uh, and the, um, the gray bars indicate the, the reference range, the normal range. We saw B cell recovery at one to two years after transplant memory B cell recovery. Um, approaching donor levels by one year post-transplant. We also saw evidence of thymic function with um, recent thymic emigrants at the level of a normal donor, particularly for the younger patients who still have the ability to recover thymic function after, after a reduced intensity transplant. The outcomes uh, were good. We had relatively low rates of graft failure for a, a a PID a patient population, 10% transplant related mortality, overall very low rates of acute um, graft versus host disease, and notably, uh, and this is held true across the 50 patients, low rates, no chronic graft versus host disease in the first 20 patients, and low rates overall, freedom from immunosuppression, relatively low rates of organ toxicity although there were some patients that had mixed chimerism and we had about 30% of patients where we gave donor lymphocyte infusions to try to ameliorate that. We did see phenotype reversal as well. And this, this figure is in the paper, so you can look at it closer if you're interested, um, but basically shows each patient's progression over time where what, what sort of immune and, and uh, infectious and malignant manifestations they have and, and the severity where a white box to the right of each patient indicates that they've had phenotype reversal for that um, manifestation. But the next steps were to try to improve the platform further after we transplanted the first 20 patients. And so we decided to shorten the duration of mycophenolate mofetil first down from 35 days to day 18 and then to none. Um, we also shortened the duration of serolimus from day 180 to day 90, particularly since we saw very little graft versus host disease. Dr. Dimitrova will actually present this next month as an oral abstract at TCT, but in decreasing the duration of, of MMF, we saw that this did not uh, change or perhaps improved overall survival and graft failure free survival. It also led to faster achievement of donor T-cell chimerism, a higher lymphocyte area under the curve, and faster recovery of T-cell counts. And so this was encouraging, but in parallel, as we were doing the, the MMF duration de-escalation, we already knew that there were some patients with mixed chimerism or even graft failure that were hard to engraft. And we knew that increasing myelotoxicity was not the answer for these patients. And that what we needed was robust lymphodepletion while preserving the immune reconstitution and the prevention of graft versus host disease that we had seen in the first 20 patients. And so we opened a new study in 2018 that Dr. Dimitrova is now the PI of, um, open to any patient with an IEI that manifested as T cell dysregulation or proliferation. It was a reduced intensity platform, again, using the same uh, options for donors. And so this was the old platform. And then what we did is we added ATG on day minus 14 and day minus 13. We switched marrow for peripheral blood as a graft source. 
We changed serolimus, which can often promote mixed T cell chimerism to tacrolimus. And at the point that we were at in the MMF duration de-escalation on the other study, we shortened the duration of MMF to day 25. So as far as the, the timing and choice of equine ATG, equine ATG has a relatively short half-life of about six days compared to rabbit ATG and alumtuzumab. And as you all know, in transplant serotherapy is often timed to serve a dual function where it, it acts to lymphodeplete the host, but also in vivo T cell deplete the graft for GVHD prophylaxis. But we were really happy with our immune reconstitution and GVHD prevention with our PT psi based approach and really didn't want to mess with that aspect of it. And so we knew that we could more distally time serotherapy to get better host lymphodepletion, but also knew that this would be very hard with rabbit ATG or alemtuzumab. And so we hypothesized that if we distally timed horse ATG on day minus 14 and day minus 13, that this would largely, if not entirely, lymphodeplete the host, but not have significant in vivo T cell depletion of the graft. So we've transplanted 15 patients to date on this hard to engraft study. Um, we've preferentially put patients with um, PA3 kinase gain of function mutations and data two, as well as the other diagnoses shown there. These were again, largely adults, um, median age of 25 years at transplant, but up to age 62. Um, with high comorbidity indices, often with lymphomas, uh, and the range of donor sources shown there. They all got PBSC grafts as one of our ways to improve engraftment. And these are the outcomes to date, which we're also very pleased with, um, where, with high overall survival and, and graft failure-free survival. The chimerism also, if you remember back to the prior study, is less um, mixed and we do see attainment of 100% donor T cell chimerism much more consistently and definitely by uh, around day 180 or a year after transplant on this study. We also have started to look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the distally timed ATG, although this is um, still in its early efforts. Dr. Rashash, who is one of the clinical research fellows who works with me, will actually be presenting these data as an oral abstract next month at TCT. Um, but shown here are what we've looked at so far, which are the total levels of ATG and plasma over time across the patients that I've talked about already, although we also use the same platform in patients with peripheral T-cell lymphomas who are shown there as well. And what you can see if you look at day zero is that uh, it does look like there are still pretty sizable levels of ATG around. Um, and so the obvious next step will be to look at how much of this ATG at day zero actually can bind to cells and have a cytotoxic effect. We also looked at the absolute lymphocyte count pre-transplant in these patients to see if that was associated with what the levels would be come day zero, but at day zero, they all actually align regardless of their prior lymphocyte count. And so again, ATG binding studies will be the way of understanding uh, this better as it relates to clinical outcomes of immune reconstitution. We did look though at immune reconstitution, at least a quick look based on ATG levels on day zero, high versus low. Um, and it does look like patients with low levels have a higher absolute lymphocyte count, CD3 count, CD8, and CD4 count. So I'm going to go back to the patient, but just a couple thoughts from what I've said. There's clearly much work to be done to continue to optimize and tailor reduced intensity and reduced myeloid toxicity approaches for patients with IEI in need of transplant. And what we know of these patients, particularly the adults with lots of comorbidities, is that myeloablative conditioning may not serve them well and should only be chosen with clear justification and rationale. And that we should continue to focus on approaches that effectively prevent GVHD 
promote immune reconstitution, and allow for the use of alternative donors. So as you all know, we should think about IEI in adults, and we should respect but not fear transplant for patients with severe IEI. So back to our patient, um, I called up the doctor who wanted to auto transplant him and had a very heated conversation about allo versus auto. Um, he refused to, to uh, support the patient's decision for an allo transplant, told me that it was malpractice to, to not take him to auto transplant. But um, nonetheless, I did uh, take him five months after his diagnosis of XGID to a non myeloblative um, HLA matched uh, transplant using the regimen that I've talked about, but using what we call the immunosuppression only arm um, for unfit patients where there is the only difference is that there is no busulfan. So it's a TBI free uh, uh, immunosuppression only approach. His course was complicated as you can imagine um, in many ways, but it was successful. And I just saw him last week in clinic following up for his four-year post-transplant visit. He's alive, he's working, he's doing well. He's managed to um, escape the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, he did have some early complications, including uh, some mild GVHD, he had invasive aspergillosis with a hyperinflammatory response that required antifungal therapy and steroids for quite some time that he's had resolution of his chronic infections and no signs of any of the mini lymphomas and LPDs he had in the past. He though was actually the second patient adult with XGID that we transplanted at the NIH and, and I don't know of others uh, in the world that have been transplanted, um, but the first was actually a, a, is a 26 year old man who had revertin mutations leading to a less severe phenotype high risk uh, with a comorbidity index of six, multiple indications for transplant, including a history of HSV, um, meningoencephalitis, and a squamous cell carcinoma, HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma of his nasal cavity. So he underwent reduced intensity transplant on the protocol that I've been talking about, and he is alive and well four and a half years later with no major complications of transplant at all, no signs of his cancer, although he does have structural damage to his brain resulting in an ongoing seizure disorder from his prior HSV encephalitis. Um, through all of these many patients, they, they each offer at least one teachable moment and we're working to share these lessons with the transplant community. I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we've learned. So, we see immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome after transplant. Um, we have learned a lot about hard to engraft diseases like ADA2 deficiency and collaborated with folks across the world to um, write up the collective experience with that. We have a lot of experience now with hypomorphic um, RAG patients, adults needing transplant. Um, we've transplanted more MAGT1 patients than, than anyone else in the world and discovered that they have a propensity to bleed during aplasia that leads to a really high risk of transplant-related mortality. We've shown that through transplant, you can restore natural killer cell function to treat HPV-associated diseases. And we've collaborated with many of you um, to, to publish the world experience on the transplant for, for activated PI3 kinase syndrome. Also, the first patient in my first trial, the one I just talked about at NIH, is a young girl named Lucy who has Job syndrome, and she is one of four patients featured in the um, three-part docu-series, uh, First in Human by the Discovery Channel. So if you have um, Three hours of time. I, I recommend the series. It's wonderful, and it follows her her pathway through my clinical trial, as well as three other patients going through first in human trials at the NIH. So IEI is not just in kids. Adults with IEI can benefit from allo transplant, and the ones that do well um, will tell you that they never knew they could feel so healthy, and they are so grateful to have gone through um, the the transplant process. I have many thanks um, to the people listed here and, and the picture on the left is, is the NIH hospital. 
where one of my data two patients, as he was leaving the hospital after his third transplant for his hard to engraft disease, a rainbow had touched down on, on the edge of, of the hospital and his mom took that picture. Um, and just gratitude for the amazing team of people, uh, clinical and preclinical, uh, as well as um, you know, the, the patients who, who uh, share their, their journey with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jen, for this wonderful uh, presentation and very inspiring too. Um, we decided that we would keep the questions till the very end. So I'd like to encourage all of you again, please uh, at any time submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and then we'll have a discussion later on. And now, um, Emma, it's your turn um, to present a general overview of transplant for allo transplant for IEI in adults and adolescents. Thanks. Can you hear me and can you see the slide? Yes, both. Perfect. Um, thanks, Michael. And Jen, thank you very much for that fabulous talk. Um, it was great. I don't think I've ever used the term slam dunk or hit by a truck in the presentation before. So that's going to be my challenge. I probably won't be able to do it today. Um, but I'm going to give a recent overview of some of the uh, data that has been published in uh, transplant for adults with immunodeficiency from the EBMT and also an update of our um, series of patients at UCL. Um, so let's see if I can move this slide. Perfect. So you are obviously all involved in looking after patients with immunodeficiency and you'll be aware that the Therapeutic options for adults include general supportive care, which is improving all the time, targeted therapies for various uh, known pathway defects for which there are either small molecules or antibody um, drugs available to uh, ameliorate the effect of a mutation affecting that particular pathway. Um, for example, abatacept in CTLA4 hepa insufficiency or JAK stat inhibitors for other diseases. But of course, none of these are curative, um, and we don't actually know um, the durability of responses to some of these targeted therapies as they've been relatively recently introduced. So for most patients, if you're looking for a curative intervention, you need to consider allogeneic stem cell transplant or gene therapy. Now, I'm not going to discuss gene therapy today because it's available only for a certain number of monogenic uh, disorders, but you'll be familiar with progress being made in that field. So the challenge for all of us is predicting which patients will do poorly with conservative or targeted therapy alone. And when is the right time to refer someone for a transplant and when is the time to first start thinking about it and to discuss it with the patient? And it's a rather flippant answer here, but when patients have just, just demonstrated a severe clinical phenotype, but actually we need to get them before they've developed too many complications. Although actually having just heard Jen present her data with their um, immunosuppression only regimens for um, very um, poor risk patients. Actually, it's possible that with continued improvement with our um, selection of transplant conditioning regimens, that actually we'll be able to include uh, sicker patients. So um, that's something we should discuss, uh, um, continue to discuss. Generally speaking, indications for transplant are life threatening infections bone marrow failure, refractory or poorly responsive autoimmune or autoinflammatory diseases, for example, patients on multiple lines of immunosuppressive therapy or patients who've had um, required multiple lines of biologics and have lost their response. Patients who develop a malignancy, typically either a viral associated cutaneous malignancy or a form of lymphoma, or indeed associated with GATA2 myelodysplasias or leukemias, 
Um, if they have a known underlying immunodeficiency, that's a clear indication to proceed to transplant to prevent future relapse. And we'll be familiar with patients who have either um, uh, genetically uh, confirmed causes of primary HLH or genetically undefined refractory or relapsed HLH. So I think when I talk to um, immuno clinical immunologists who look after these patients, um, I think the risk of not discussing or introducing the concept of transplant early in adult patients is you have the risk of them undergoing a sudden rapid deterioration, uh, which then essentially precludes them proceeding to transplant because of their comorbidity, or just the gradual progressive end organ damage. And I think that's actually, a, a, on a practical level, that's a real challenge, because when you see people regularly in clinic and you've looked after them for many years, a very subtle decline over time. Um, it may not raise particular red flags for you, particularly if you've been looking after patients for 5, 10, 15 years, but actually you can get to the point where, they're, where they have had progressive end organ damage and transplant. They've really missed the boat for transplant. So I'm now going to turn to um, an EBMT retrospective study, um, which uh, last week, or maybe 10 days ago, was accepted for publication in Blood, and um, this is a large retrospective study that the Inborn Errors Working Party has put together over the last couple of years. Our inclusion criteria for this study were a diagnosis of an IEI, age of transplant of 15 years or older, obviously an allogeneic transplant, and we included patients who've been transplanted since 2000, and um, we had it, to ensure sufficient follow-up, um, we didn't include patients transplanted since 2018. Our primary endpoints were overall survival and event-free survival, uh, and we were interested in determining the influence on both overall and event-free survival of a number of IEI or PID-specific um, uh, risk factors. So in addition to the HCTCI score, which is the standard transplant comorbidity score, we looked at factors like bronchiectasis, colitis, immunosuppressive therapy, prior splenectomy, genetic subtype of immunodeficiency, presence of autoimmunity or inflammatory lung disease, and previous malignancy. In the study, we have 329 patients, so it's a very large series, and the median follow-up post-transplant uh, was 44 uh, months. And you can see from this rather busy table of patient demographics, um, I'll draw your attention to some of the most important factors. We divided the patients into combined immune deficiencies, which made up half of the patients, um, phagocytic disorders, which made up nearly 40% of patients, and then predominantly antibody deficiency patients. And we base this classification on the most recent IUIS uh, classification. The median age at transplant was 18, and the uh, interquartile range was 16 to 22, but our older patients were in their mid to late 50s. Interestingly, most patients had been diagnosed in childhood but hadn't been treated until late adolescence or adulthood with their transplant. Half of patients had infection at the time of transplant. A quarter of patients had bronchiectasis at the time of transplant. About a fifth of patients had colitis or protracted diarrhea at the time of transplant. 20% or so of patients had a previous malignancy, and 40% uh, uh, of patients, if they'd had a prior malignancy, were in remission at the time of transplant. A small group of patients had inflammatory lung disease, 10% of patients had had a prior splenectomy, and approximately 15% of patients had uh, significant hepatic comorbidity. We also group patients into the number of uh, immunodeficiency-associated complications they had at the time of transplant 
uh, split broadly into bronchiectasis, colitis, gilial splenectomy, and protracted diarrhea. And we also, as with Jen's cohort, the majority of our patients had uh, significantly elevated uh, comorbidity scores. For interest, 81% of the 329 patients had a confirmed genetic diagnosis at the time of transplant. And you can see the list of um, patients and their underlying uh, genetic mutations here. On the left are the phagocyte disorders, in the middle, the combined immune deficiencies, and on the right, the patients we included in the predominant antibody deficiency group, or PAD. The majority were CBID patients, but there were some APDS and three XLA patients. So when we look at the overall survival at a median follow-up of 44 months post-transplant, you can see that the subgroup of immunodeficiency significantly influenced overall survival. And the patients with the best overall survival were those in the phagocyte disorders group, the majority of whom had CGD. Patients with combined immune deficiency, that's the red line in the middle, um, uh, were the intermediate group. And the patients who were doing worse in terms of overall survival were those predominantly antibody deficiency patients. We also found that the number of peer associated complications was significantly uh, impacting overall survival and patients doing better with less active peer associated complications at the time of transplant. So relating back to being able to identify poor risk patients but who don't have severe or active disease at the time of transplant. When we looked at event-free survival, um, both IEI subgroup and the number of IEI associated complications again were predictors of inferior outcome with patients again with the CBID and the predominant antibody deficiencies doing worse with about 50% event free survival and patients with multiple IEI associated complications doing worse. You will see, however, that most of the fall off is in the first six to nine months, and that once patients get to about 12 months post transplant, in all of these curves, you'll see a, a good plateau, which suggests a lot of the toxicity of transplant is around the peri transplant period and allows us uh, the opportunity to optimize both our pre treatment of our patients almost like an equivalent of a malignancy remission induction, um, but also, um, as Jen has demonstrated beautifully from their NIH cohort, the impact of optimizing the conditioning regimen on outcomes. Interestingly, we found that age was not important for either overall survival or event-free survival, um, although there were inferior outcomes for um, the older patients, this was not statistically significant. So if we look at multivariable analysis, I've just um, highlighted this graph here, and I'd like you to look at the bottom line. And when you um, consider alone the patients with common variable immunodeficiency in our our study included 27 patients, which is a relatively small number of of patients I accept out of a cohort of 329, these had the most inferior outcome in terms of overall survival at 48% at five years and event-free survival of 51% at five years. And if you compare this to the phagocyte disorder groups where that overall survival at five years is 78% and event-free survival is 69%. And again, as shown you on the curves, the combined immune deficiencies fall uh, between these two groups. When we considered other factors in terms of multivariable analysis, it was only the number of IEI complications that were statistically significant in terms of affecting uh, event-free survival. So patients with more complications at transplant did worse. Interestingly, conditioning intensity uh, was no longer significant. So um, that data will be in preprint or not preprint, will be um, uh, online soon in blood uh, and will be published in due course. 
So I just want to finish by discussing um, some single centre data. So this is from our UCL centre, um, which is a, a centre for immunodeficiency that combines uh, the adult immunodeficiency service at the Royal Free Hospital and the adolescent and adult transplant service at UCLH, which are linked by the same university, UCL. Uh, and we work very closely with our colleagues at Great Ormond Street to transition their patients to us who haven't been transplanted before the age of 15. And this is data um, which was last updated in September, so about five to six months ago. And this is unpublished. So similar to um, the NIH group, we've now... Uh, uh, this, this presentation includes data on 68 patients. We've now uh, transplanted about 75. But um, our cohort at UCL is predominantly combined immune deficiencies, so we've had less CGD patients. And uh, we have uh, had a redo, allo or we've had an allo transplant of a prior uh, gene therapy for SCID and, uh, and a hypermorphic uh, SCID similar to um, Jones codes. Um, of these, 91% of our patients have had positive genetic defects identified. Our median age at transplant is 20 and goes up to 56. Um, and the indication for transplant included the current infections, colitis, HLH, autoimmunity or refractory cytopenias or malignancy. Um, a third of our patients had an HCTI score of greater than three. And we also tried to validate uh, Marcus Seidel's IDDA score, which is an immune deficiency and immune dysregulation score. And we were able to calculate the IDDA score of patients pre and post transplant. And just in a bit more detail here, we had an adolescent cohort of 26 patients between the age of 13 and 18 and 42 patients who were over the age of 19 at the age of transplant. The majority of patients had unrelated donors um, and all patients had reduced intensity uh, conditioning regimens, uh, none quite as complicated as the NIH regimens and predominantly based on FMC, so Fludarabin, Malfalan, and Malentuzabab, or Fludarabin, Fusulfan with either Alamtuzumab or ATG. Almost all of our patients had serotherapy for T cell depletion. Uh, and what you can see here is an overall survival curve on the left for the whole cohort of 68 patients and a GVHD free, graph failure free survival curve on the right for the whole cohort of 68 patients. And actually, I've split this by the HCTCI score of the patient at transplant, and the patients with the higher comorbidities going into transplant really do worse. And some of these late events occur in patients with significant lung disease at the time of transplant, whereas the patients with good uh, condition, low comorbidity scores at the time of transplant are doing very well. And again, we see a very convincing plateau in these patients. So we have an overall survival of 94% for 50 patients undergoing transplant with a comorbidity score of less than three, and a graph failure uh, GVHD free survival of 85%. We then looked to see whether age was important, and this is the whole cohort, and actually it's not statistically significant. Again, you see a slight improvement in terms of um, uh, results for the younger patients, but it's not statistically significant. And the curve on the right is really just to show you that in the last 12 years, our uh, results are improving. So I think with experience, we're getting better at patient selection. And I think a lot of this to do with our regular international MDT meetings and discussions with colleagues around the world regarding uh, risk assessment of patients and risk-benefit analysis comparing their potential outcome with conservative therapy alone and or with transplant. So I go back to the IDDA score and we have been able to report that allotransplant in our patients reverses the IDDA score pre-transplant. You can see on the right that the median IDDA pre-transplant was 17 
and reduced to 1.6 post-transplant. And you can see here, this is data from the um, uh, Marcus's paper in Jackie when he first reported this score, which he designed to assess patients actually with LRBA and other combined immune deficiencies. And these are the factors included in the scoring system. We were also able to demonstrate that allo transplant in the vast majority of patients prevents recurrent infections with pre-transplant status and the post-transplant status. And an example here is a patient with permission with DOC8 deficiency, a 38-year-old man who pre-transplant had very severe HPV positive cutaneous warts affecting both hands and feet. And it doesn't project very well, but he has confluent feet, uh, confluent feet, confluent warts on the soles of his feet. And uh, one of the major indications for transplant were um, his warts, which were affecting his mobility on his feet, but also preventing him securing a job um, because uh, people wouldn't offer him a job when he went to interview, they wouldn't shake his hands. And he'd also had two episodes of malignancy, squamous cell carcinoma associated with his roots that had been treated. So he went to transplant, hopeful that um, a healthy immune constitution and full donor chimerism would um, significantly improve his warts, as this was one of his indications for transplant. And you can see when he was coming back to clinic in the first year post-transplant, it was all rather depressing. And I have to say, um, this was shortly after he'd stopped immune suppression. He'd had a grade two skin GVHD, um, but by this time, at seven months post-transplant, his GVHD was quiescent and he was off all immune suppression, but his warts had um, significantly progressed in the peri-transplant period of immune suppression for GVHD prophylaxis. And I reassured him that over the next few months, I imagined that his warts would improve significantly. When he came back to see me at a year post-transplant, however, um, they were still continuing to get worse. And he and I were looking at each other wondering whether the transplant had actually uh, been the right thing to do. And I'm pleased to report that by two and a half years post-transplant, there was quite a marked improvement. I think probably most visible on the palms of his hands, but actually the soles of his feet uh, were significantly better. Um, and I think this is an important lesson because part of this is about us learning how to counsel our patients and manage their expectation. The time taken for resolution of, of warts in patients with GATA2 or DOC8 is actually a significant post-transplant, but we have patients with GATA2 deficiency who've undergone trans allotransplantation who had severe perineal uh, HPV disease with dysplasia and malignancy who, have, who are beginning to get normal cervical smears um, at about five years post-transplant. So there is quite a significant lag in improvement. So that was one of the aspects of infection. Then just before I finish, patients who um, were treated with active colitis at the time of transplant also had a very impressive response to allo transplant. Um, and so our, we had a significant number of patients in our cohort with refractory colitis on biologics and in the suppressive therapies pre-transplant who all had resolution of transplant except for two patients who died of transplant-related mortality unrelated to their gut. Um, as with Jen, Jen's cohort, we see good immune reconstitution. At um, 12 months follow-up, 80% of our patients were off immunoglobulin replacement therapy um, with normal immunoglobulins with good uh, lymphocyte subsets and good T-cell proliferation in patients who um, these uh, studies have been performed, either normal or impaired, and uh, uh, good protective vaccine responses in the patients in whom this has been tested. Um, we have, I think, compared to the NIH protocol, we 
it's fair to say we achieve um, up to 95% donor chimerism in the majority of our patients, but full donor chimerism in the T cell compartment probably less frequently than in the NIH regimen, and that's something we should look at, but we see stable uh, mixed chimerism in our patients. So I guess some of the big questions are, which are the patients that we should actually consider for transplant? I think, although I've, the EBNT study and our own data suggests that age is not statistically significant, um, we know from standard adult allogeneic transplant practice that we can transplant patients with an allograft up into their early 60s um, without uh, significant problems. So I think I wrote this uh, curve before we had the EBMD data and I gave a random cutoff of 20 years. And actually, you know, if, it, if you're under 20, obviously your outcome is going to be a lot better. But I think um, there's a lot of room for manoeuvre in our patients in terms of age, and I don't think age at all should be a determining factor for you with birth transplant. Um, clearly, it's helpful if patients have a disease where the genetics is known, where the, where the natural history is really well understood and where you can predict a poor prognosis for a patient where the risk of transplant is acceptable. Um, so I was going to go through some cases, but I think given the time, Michael, I would be happy to stop there so we can have time to answer people's uh, questions if you think that would be better. Uh, do you want to do maybe one? <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, okay, so actually I can do this because it's I'm much shorter than Jen's. It's basically one slide. So this is just to give you a flavour of the kind of patients that get referred to us in our transplant clinic who are already adults who are being considered for transplant. So they can be broadly divided into patients who have actually been clinically symptomatic from early childhood, but for a variety of reasons have not been transplanted in childhood or early adolescence. And then we have patients who actually don't present uh, either to an immunologist or to a physician uh, until uh, adulthood. So if we look at typical patients who've been ill since their childhood, and, and these are all patients that we have assessed in our service. So a 28-year-old man, who was diagnosed with excellent CGD at the age of two. His childhood was complicated by oral granulomatosis and urinary tract obstruction treated with steroids. And he was well then until about the age of 16 uh, when he developed CGD colitis. And after that time, he was on and off steroids for a number of years until he became refractory to steroids and started bedalusumab. And at the time of referral to us, he was on bedalusumab and his bowels were opening approximately eight times a day with watery bloody stool. He had had two episodes of aspergillus pneumonia at the age of 21 and 23, despite adequate azole prophylaxis and occasional bacterial lower respiratory tract infection. So an assessment of this case, this 28 year old man with a known monogenic uh, immunodeficiency that's well understood and the natural history now of patients with XCGD is well understood and we can predict that this man is going to have a poor, poor prognosis. We know that accumulation of complications occurs with age in patients with excellent CGD and uh, there is clear evidence to support good outcomes following allogeneic stem cell transplant from single centre published data but also large uh, multi-center series such as the EBMT uh, uh, CGD study and now more recently our study. So I think that's a, oh, I can use Jen's face, that's a slam dunk, right? This guy needs to be transplanted. I think that's fairly obvious. He needs to be optimized first. So then the second case is an 18-year-old male who presented with PCP pneumonitis at the age of three months, but had a positive family history of CD40 ligand deficiency. His childhood was complicated by EBV-associated tonsillar enlargement, and slightly oddly, maybe it was a thing then, but had a tonsillectomy as treatment for that. 
And then by the time he was referred to us, age 18, he was just left home, going to university, was completely well, hadn't had any other medical problems. Um, he had an older brother who had been affected and died in infancy. So this is slightly more challenging. He's got a known monogenic IEI, but the clinical phenotype and also heterogeneity within a family is quite challenging. There's actually limited evidence, I would say, supporting transplant in adults and older children with CD40 ligand deficiency, partly because there's been very few transplants performed in adults. So we're sitting on the fence with this guy at the moment who's gone to university, he's currently well, who hasn't really had any of those red, red flag interventions. But, you know, we worry about him because he's got an inborn error of immunity. So then the next two patients are patients who presented in adulthood, a 26-year-old female who was completely well until she was 19, and then she developed vaccine-associated yellow fever and had prolonged hospitalization and didn't end up going on holiday where she was hoping to go. At the age of 20, she developed extensive HPV-associated warts with severe dysplasia and intraepithelial neoplasia. She subsequently developed inflammatory bowel disease, recurrent chest infections, and bronchiectasis was identified. And she was started on prophylactic antibiotics and immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Just prior to her being referred to us, she had had a bone marrow to investigate cytopenias and was found to have myelodysplasia, but no increased blast and no evidence of AML. And at that time, uh, actually, after she'd been referred to us, we got genetic sequencing back to um, say that she had GATA2 deficiency or she had a mutation in GATA2. And this was around the time the first reports of GATA2 were being uh, published. So actually, she had a new diagnosis of an inborn error of immunity in adulthood. And at the time, it had only relatively been, uh, only relatively recently been described. But there's now very clear evidence supporting the efficacy of transplant in patients with GATA2, and she went on to have transplant with successful outcome. Now, this is my heart sink patient, and we have many patients like this, and I think we still haven't solved these problems. So a 35-year-old man who was well until the age of 17, presented with vitiligo, recurrent respiratory tract infections, and hypogammaglobulinemia. Uh, sorry, and recurrent respiratory tract infections. Quite a long time later, at the age of 30, he was found incidentally to have hypogammaglobulinemia, was diagnosed with CBID, and put on immunoglobulin replacement therapy and prophylactic antibiotics. And he was effectively a simple CBID patient. However, over the next three years, he developed bronchiectasis, chronic norovirus infections, splenomegaly, hypersplenism, granulomatous hepatitis, nodular regenerative hyperplasia and focal hypertension. When he was referred to us, he had grade two esophageal varices, ascites, despite spironolactone, completely refractory neurovirus infection in his gut and progressively worsening quality of life. However, his synthetic liver function was preserved. So he was diagnosed with an inborn error of immunity. We don't have any genetics on him despite um, him being sequenced. Uh, so he's, an, uh, he's, a, he's not got an associated monogenic cause of his CBID. To, to this day, there remains a, a, a lack of evidence supporting transplant in adults with complex CBID, and trials are required. So I'm going to finish there with that flavour of the sort of patients that we have to make transplant decisions on. Oh, I need to, no, I can't stop there. I need to show a picture of my colleagues. They're here. Siobhan, she's in the room next door to me and she'll bang on the wall if she, if I don't show her picture. So these are my um, fantastic colleagues who run the Joint Immunology Transplant Service at UCL. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you. And uh, thank you, Emma, for showing these cases because I think they, illustrate extremely well our uh, daily practice and um, what we need to do. And um, I'm afraid your last patient is probably too sick to go to transplant. <laughs>
um, while your patient number three probably should have received whole exome when she was 19 and developed her first signs of the inborn errors of immunodeficiency and should have gone to transplant much earlier these days. But yeah, we have a number of questions and um, I would like to start uh, with one um, to uh, Jen, who has already been busy answering them in the chat, but I will, I will still pose them here so you can answer them again for everybody. Um, one question is about adult patients with XLA, especially those with autoimmune complications like colitis and arthritis. Do you consider them candidates for a transplant? Yes, we do. And, and I haven't transplanted an XLA patient, but, but I put some of the other diseases that can manifest with colitis and, and inflammatory arthritis. And, and the patients do really well. Um, you have to kind of tease apart what's not reversible anymore and, and what is reversible and, um, and really make sure that you're going to be able to improve their quality of life. But from the standpoint of being able to get off biologics and, and immunomodulating drugs, um, that's usually a huge relief for them. But we've also seen the process to be slow where their arthritis takes quite a bit of time um, to really reach the point of, of maximal phenotype reversal. But Yes, I consider that an indication for transplant of severe. Yeah, and I see Emma nodding, and I think we completely agree uh, with that. And there have been a number of questions on your regimen, uh, specific questions on your uh, regimen. Um, pentostatin is a um, atypical choice, I would say. It's not very frequently employ employed, at least over here in Europe. Um, would you be able to comment on using pentostatin versus, for example, fludarabin? Um, so the, the reason I chose pentostatin was because uh, it, the, the pentostatin was developed at the NCI and, and then work um, with, with cyclophosphamide, looking at lipid depletion between cyclophosphamide and fludarabine and, and cyclophosphamide and pentostatin was done by Dan Fowler in our branch. And so I designed the study to build off of that work. And, and I do think it's a very potent, um, you know, lymphodepleting agent where it, 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 relative to fludarabine, it not only depletes T cells better, but leaves the remaining T cells more functionally impaired. Um, but it, it does create like a very clunky regimen. It's a long regimen. It has hyperfractionated cyclophosphamide. That's the, that's the downside uh, of it all. Um, but uh, they also don't drop their counts until, you know, day nine or so after transplant, but they simmer down from the standpoint of whatever ails them. And so it actually gives a lot of time to sort of further optimize them as you're going through this long conditioning regimen, almost like a cooling off type period um, so that they really look good come transplant day. Their skin heals up if they have open, you know, open sores and other things, which, which is the plus side of a, a 14 to 11 day conditioning regimen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can fully agree with that, especially since the regimen is mainly immunosuppressive and yeah. to many of these patients, immunosuppressive therapy is actually a good thing, at least in the short term. Um, I have a question for Emma, which came in relatively early, and I think uh, both of you have already partially at least answered it, but I would still like to hear your maybe more um, detailed thoughts on it. So which patients with multi-organ dysfunction, when is the right time to transplant them? Um, as we know, it's as you already said, it's hard to say, but maybe you can still add a thought. And also the question... When would you, example, for example, consider co-transplanting a so solid organ such as a lung or liver? Actually, a question that's coming up more and more in our practice in pediatrics as well. Yeah, okay. So uh, thanks for the really super easy questions. Um, <laughs> I, I think, well, if I was being, if I was joking, I'd say when is the time, right time to transplant patients is always 
before. <laughs> it's all. I, I mean, I genuinely think um, we're with, we're seeing patients too late, uh, um, and I think we would. Uh, Jen and I, who predominantly transplant adults, I think, you know, obviously we want to do it. It's our thing. We love it. And we'd rather patients who are referred to us. And uh, and when I say too late, I don't mean too old, but I mean accumulation of too many problems. And and I think that's, that's really tricky because that actually relates to the ability to predict what's going to happen in patients with rare disease where the natural history of that disease is not well described or there's real cl clinical heterogeneity. So I, I'm not, I think it's a really difficult thing for people to pick the right time. And I just wonder whether we should have, start having conversations with uh, treating immunologists and with the patients much earlier in their disease course so that the concept that at, you know when they're diagnosed at the moment you're relatively well we're going to give you these interventions essentially supported therapy or treat infections when you get them or complications but there may come a time when you've had one or two of those that we start worrying about uh, what the future will be for you and at that time we should start talking about alternative treatment options which could include a transplant so I think kind of, I think we should be trying to push it forward a bit. I think we've got good data now from the NIH studies, from the EBMT studies, from single centres, that we can deliver allograft safely in adults, that, that the outcomes are as good as we see in children. And actually the previous historical reluctance to refer patients, I think we kind of need to get over that. Um, so I think... Before they've got multiple organ dysfunction is clearly the right time. Um, the, the patients who are in our, and, I, and in fact, I didn't show that today and I apologise, but in the EBMT paper that will be in blood, hepatic comorbidity is a really poor predictor of outcome. So patients who have significant liver problems, it, it's a real struggle to get them safely through a transplant and that's multifactorial. And so that kind of brings me on to when would you consider co-transplant. Um, the issues, um, we, we, we have been around the houses with this a number of times. And in fact, we've done a liver and bone marrow transplant in a patient uh, with a combined immune deficiency who sadly died at 90 days post allograft and he got through his liver transplant without complication effectively. Um, and the... Some of the problems we face are really practical ones. So then patients have a liver fun or liver abnormalities that make us terrified as transplant as bone marrow transplanters, but their liver function is not bad enough for them to be listed for a liver transplant. And so the liver transplant teams are from an ethical perspective when they have a cadaveric organ and they need to allocate it to someone who's on a large waiting list of people needing a liver transplant. They you know, go by severity, but they also go by published outcome of um, you know, survival following liver transplant. So we fall down a bit there. So the patients that we want to have a liver transplant to facilitate a bone marrow transplant, generally, we don't want to wait until their liver completely falls apart and they have complete hepatic decompensation. Um, and then if they do, then we don't, at the moment, have a huge amount of data to support successful outcome, either in combined procedures. There is some for um, CD40 ligand. I think that's been published. Um, but patients who've had a single liver organ transplant for immunodeficiency, uh, a single liver transplant, tend to not do very well. And it's clearly because they need to have, they need to correct the inborn of immunity as well. So what we're trying to do with our liver transplant colleagues in the UK is to put together a prospective pilot study and to get agreement from the ethical board for the transplant community in terms of liver transplantation that they would allow us to do a certain number of patients and then assess the outcome. And I think lung is probably lung presumably is a similar scenario. We've only really had one patient who we toyed with the idea of lung, but it, it didn't get anywhere. <laughs>
I think these are real these are real issues, aren't they, that are becoming more and more yeah. Well, thank you for um, trying to address these. And um, every single patient will present differently and present with a different uh, problem with this respect. So um, I would like to give you the chance to ask a question to Jen. You mentioned you had one. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's a bit cheap. Well, I've got two questions for Jen. And also, I know Siobhan's put a question in the Q&A, which I can also answer, ask for, for her. Um, she wants to know, this is a killer, how do you optimise your patients with multiple problems and infection? Uh, does it require long inpatient stays for treatment prior to transplant, or do you manage them as outpatients? Um, I mean, everyone's different as far as what needs to be optimised, but it's, and that's where we have the luxury of the NIH being able to do a lot of things without the stresses of insurance and, and healthcare coverage. Um, but often we will, as an outpatient, they'll be going through multiple diagnostic procedures and sort of head to toe evaluations, um, getting in, getting their lungs, sort of their pulmonary hygiene optimized and infections optimized. Uh, um, but we don't usually do much of that uh, as an inpatient, it can be done in clinic. Um, often we're still looking for a donor during that time, or you know, if we're using a family member, we're making sure they're not affected. And so you, we often have time to do the transplant right to really optimize um, patients because there are other factors that are still taking up some time as well. Okay, can I ask you my question? So the data for your, your hard to engraft regimen, which included the equine ATG and the tacrolimus, and that's really, really impressive chimerism that you're getting really early and really good in your constitution. Um, I imagine it's a pain to deliver the regimen, but actually uh, the, results, <laughs> uh, the results are fantastic. And it just made me wonder whether you, you're going to, what, why are you reserving that just for your hard to engraft patients? Are you going to start using that for everyone then? Because well, we've got yeah, to so believe that full lineage engraftment in everyone and good in the constitution is what we're aiming for, right? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, the regimen that doesn't include ATG does work well for certain diseases. And so I don't feel compelled to give it to everyone. Um, and I get, I get teased on the transplant ward, you know, the transplant ID doctors will be like, have you transplanted that patient yet? Because it's like still day minus eight and, and I'm still giving them chemo. Um, but, uh, but we, you know, I, I sort of offhandedly mentioned it, but there's a parallel study in peripheral T cell lymphoma, because that's another group of patients who you know, really does it comes to transplant in bad shape and, and really needs something to kill T cells well. It works amazingly well in, in those patients too. Um, and I have another study opening that will be a, a, a new application of it in a, in a different patient population um, with a different GVHD prophylaxis approach, actually, um, to try to further shorten the duration of immunosuppression. Um, but I, I, I just don't think it's necessary for absolutely everyone. And it is two weeks that starts with ATG, which we do in the hospital. So it's, it's just kind of a pain, you know, to have them there, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, did you have another question, Emma? Well, I would, yeah, but it was really, it was just about, I noticed that you've given DLI for a few of your mixed mimerism patients. And we always, I always find that a bit, a, a difficult decision in the immunodeficiency patients rather than in the patients. And I think yeah. that's a psychological hurdle I need to overcome. But whether, was that for T-cell mixed mimerism or multi-lineage? It, it was for T cell mixed chimerism, and and that was really on the first study. We haven't had that issue on the on the ATG containing study, um, and you know, we have a lot of comfort giving DLI with PT based approaches because it, uh, 
you know, it, it doesn't seem to incite graft versus host disease, but on the flip side, it also doesn't seem to do anything. And so <laughs> it's, um, it, it, the PT PTSI, I think really sets up a, an environment where you could give a ton of DLI and, and you're just not going to see a, an effect. Now that's totally different than other approaches, particularly if you have proximal serotherapy and you should not be just willy nilly giving DLI, um, uh, in those types of settings, but it, it's uh, with PT Psy, DLI does nothing, I think. And we need to publish that too, because we've actually given a lot of DLIs for various things. Okay. And use the PT Psy if you've got a matched family donor as well, you don't reserve it just for your haplos and your mice. We use it for everyone, yeah. Yeah, the I, question I, was also in the chat, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's our preference, that, and that's obviously a, a massive extension of, of, of the PTSI approach for mismatch to even um, match donors, but it's, um, it, it's how I was trained. And, you know, once you learn a way you like to do things, you sort of, it's, it's hard to rethink, relearn. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I think uh, this is a very good time to wrap it up. Um, I would like to thank the two of you very much for um, giving these awesome presentations and uh, being available for all those very interesting questions. I think this was um, very informative and it's a, it kind of is a completely new field in transplant, so it's really uh, exciting. And I would like to thank ESIT and the Clinical Working Party to give us uh, the chance to hold this webinar and uh, to everyone out there listening. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening to this and hope to see you soon in, at the next um, ECID webinar. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.